Man, it's been a long, strange trip, hasn't it? This poem has taken us all kinds of places. We're coming to at least a partial close. At, Britta Mart is about to meet her last adventure of book three and defeat, well, if not the big bad, the level boss, if you will, for gamers out there. Britta Mart is also becoming a more heroic character and has come into her fullest powers near the end of book three. She, we are gonna see her back in a, another house with another weird, with bad, where bad weird things are going on where she is, in this case, very much correct to not take off her armor. Um, but first, we're gonna see that Britta Mart is, has, has gained abilities she didn't seem to have before. And it's not just the enchanted spear anymore. We meet briefly the giant Oliphant, a kind of double, the twin brother of the lustful giantist Argante. He's a lustful giant. He's chasing a young boy. Yes, that's that's homoerotic involuntary love, like an attempt at homosexual rape. Um, and Saturain, who fought with Argante before, is now going to chase Oliphant and Britomar too. And Oliphant runs from Britomar because he cannot abide chastity. He is, she is terrifying to this terrifying giant. She meets our boy Scudamore, whose name means Shield of Love. He is lying, wallowing in a glade, crying, weeping, complaining. And if he seems emo and weak, he is emo and weak. But we should also know at this point that all lovers complain like this. Here is our final lover's complaint of book three. <sighs> Yes, and he's crying because he can't rescue his lady love. But even Arthur complains. Even Britomar complains. Okay. The castle of Boozerain, where Amaret has been imprisoned, is protected by enchanted fire. Scudamore can't get through it. Britomar can. The power of chastity gets her through that fire. She is come to a point where she is proof against supernatural um, obstacles and is very much to be reckoned with. And she's about to not solve her quest, but save another woman who's in jeopardy. First though, Spencer's gonna stop and describe the place. The castle of the Enchanter Boozerain, like the castle of Malacasta, is extremely richly furnished and especially furnished with tapestries. In book one, again, structural elements pay off. In book one, the tapestries were all about Venus, goddess of love, and her tragic love affair with the boy Adonis, whose garden we meet in book six. There are even more tapestries described in Canto, uh, uh, sorry, in Canto six. In Canto 11, there are even more tapestries. And they're not Venus, they're Cupid. We get an exhaustive list, or a set what feels like an exhaustive list, maybe just an exhausting list, of the various gods and occasional heroes whom Cupid has overcome. Everybody plays the fool sometimes. Cupid gets everybody. This is all taken from the great Roman poet Ovid. Sexy, funny stories about mythology. Ovid is very funny and very sexy. Here's a copy. If you're not going to read all of a classic work besides the ones we've already got on the list, which is plenty, remember Edith Hamilton's Mythology is a quick, easy go-to guide in prose with an index. If you don't know who Saturn is, you don't know who Hela is, you look it up. And we're going to stop for many stanzas while Spencer retells in digest form the story of the gods in love that's in Ovid already. Imitation is part of the epic approach. And it's not simply weak imitation. It's not just being a copycat. The point is to try to overgo, to do better what the previous epic poets have done. You do everything the masters have done, but you do it to display your own mastery by showing how much more poetic skill you can bring to what the others have done. This will become important in Unit 4 when we meet Englishman John Milton, who is also going to be trying to write with a great epic, it's not a romance, 
his great epic of heaven, hell, and everything in between, Paradise Lost, Milton will also also is invested heavily in imitation and in competitive imitation. You imitate the masters to, out, to both to show your respect, but also to show that you have outgrown them, you've outdone them, you can do it better, and you're moving the epic genre forward. So we're going to stop and recapitulate um, all the loves of the gods in these in these tapestries, which Bridgman is looking at. Let me let's turn to stanza twenty-eight. <laughs> well, the previous times we've left poor Scudamore outside, he can't get through the fire. For round about the walls it clothed were with goodly arras of great majesty, woven with gold and silk so close and near that the rich metal lurked privily, as feigning to be hid from envious eye. Yet here and there and everywhere unwares it showed itself and shone unwillingly like to a discolored snake whose hidden snake whose hidden snares through the green grass his long bright burnished back declares let me stop there they are there's a, the description there is of the metal gold these arises these tapestries with narratives on them um, if you would like to see some narrative tapestries there are some at the Cleveland Museum of Art and there are a bunch of mythological tapestries they tell actually the tale of, D of Dido and Aeneas from the Aeneid up there in the armor court up by a, up at the top of the armor court here they're silk and gold but the gold is sneaky this most of this stanza is about the gold the rich metal lurked privily sneakily pri privately but sneakily privily secretly and it's lurking, as feigning to be hid from envious eye. And we'll bring back some of Malbecco's lust for gold. Like, it's hiding. It doesn't want to be seen. Yet here and there and everywhere unwares, catching you on the wrist, but also unwarily being caught, it showed itself and shone unwillingly, despite itself, like to a discolored snake whose hidden snares through the green grass's long bright burnished back declares. So we get the sneaky thread, the gold threads that run through all the tapestries that are shining unwillingly. They're trying to hide, but they're shining out here and there. You can see little spots of them. And they're like a snake, possibly a poison snake, with its snares hiding in the grass, but it's too brightly colored and it shows out against the green. The gold here is imagined as a dangerous snake. It's a valuable thing. Um, and there's, let's see, stanza 29 through 42, 46, wow. Okay, um, up through 46, we're gonna go for, we're gonna go for 18 stanzas just describing the gods and love. Might be something, it might turn up an exam one day, one of these, might be other places in this, this poem is rich with stanzas that could be used in an exam. At the upper end of the fair room, there was an altar bit, oh, I'm sorry, 46. Kings, queens, lords, ladies, knights, and damsels, gent were heaped together with the vulgar sort and mingled with the rascal rabblement, without respect of person or of port, to show Dan Cupid's power and great effort. And round about a border was entrailed, a broken bows and arrows shivered short, and along a bloody river through them railed, so lively and so like that living sense it failed. So the thing it's threading through now is not a thread of gold, but a river of blood. Or back to the metaphor of something sinks through. And then we have a description, a three stanza description of the idol of Cupid. And at the upper end of that fair room, there was an altar built of precious stone of passing value and of great renown, on which there stood an image all alone of massy gold, with it, which with his own light shone and wings it had with sundry colors dight, more sundry colors than the Pab Pavone beers in his boasted fan, or iris bright, when her discolored bow she spreads through heavens bright, more colors than the rainbow, more colors than the peacock's tail. An idol. Idols are bad. Idolatry is a cardinal sin, and Protestantism, among other things, doubles down on the no images rule. Spencer views idolatry as a very, very bad thing. Blindfold he was in his cruel fist, a mortal bow and arrows keen did hold, with which he shot at random when he lists some headed with sad lead, some with pure gold. Ah, oh, man, beware how though those darts behold, a wounded dragon under him did lie whose hideous tail his left foot did enfold, and with a shaft was shot through with either eye, that no man forth might draw, and no man remedy. And underneath his, fit, his feet was written thus, 
unto the victor of the gods this be. And all the people in that ample house did to that image bow their humble knee and oft committed foul idolatry. That wondrous sight, fair Britomart amazed. Nessian could her wonder satisfy, but ever more and more upon it gazed, the whilst the passing brightness her frail senses dazed. And we see Britomart's actually in trouble there. She's going to get out of this, but she is in danger too. If just two cantos ago, she was the one whose beauty stunned um, the other knights and, and elevated them and nobled them. Here, she is potentially a victim to the problem of the eye that Cupid, she is not an idolater yet, but she's looking. And skip ahead to stanzas 53 and 54, which are important. The warlike maid beholding earnestly the goodly ordinance of this rich place did greatly wonder, nor could satisfy her greedy eyes with gazing a long space. But more she marveled that no footings traced, no white appeared, but wasteful emptiness and solemn silence over all that place. Strange thing it seemed, that none was to possess such rich purveyance, nor them keep with carefulness. She is, they are, it's greedy wonder. It's a negative. The greed there is a danger, and she cannot be satisfied. This is a thing that just leads to more and more. It's dangerous, but she starts to suppose no one here, and there are no footprints. There's no, no one settled the... No one's unsettled the dust, there's no sound. This is an incredibly rich place that's weirdly empty. And as she looked about, she did behold how over that same door was likewise written, be bold, be bold, and everywhere be bold. That much she mused, yet could not construe it by any riddling skill, skill or commune wit. At last she spied at that Rome's upper end another iron door on which was writ, be not too bold. Whereto, though she did bend her earnest mind, yet wist not, yet wist not what it might intend. And in the last stanza, she waits till even till evening falls. And we left for this riddle: be bold, be bold, be not too bold. A message for chastity and for love. One of the most quotable lines from this, even though it's spread out against the stanza: be bold, be bold, be not too bold. Well, let's see how Britomart completes that mission.